in two minutes' time at exactly 2 p.m. West African time. Thank you. webinar series. This webinar series is organized to discuss issues around impacts and response to COVID-19 in Africa and is organized by the Global Emerging Pathogens Treatment Consortium, GET. Please permit me to talk about GET for one minute. GET is Global Emerging Pathogens Treatment Consortium, an organization that was set up in August 2014 as a direct response to the Ebola crisis that ravaged some West African countries in 2014 to 2016. One of the things we learned during the Ebola crisis was that most African countries or West African countries were not prepared and don't have the facility, the infrastructure, and the human personnel to cope with such level of health challenge and to cope with pandemics or epidemics of such magnitude. So there was an urgent need to develop or to form organizations that can build capacity infrastructures and influence policy within the continent and prepare countries within the continent to cope with epidemics and pandemics of such magnitude. And Global Emerging Pathogens Treatment Consortium Gates was one of the organizations that was formed then in 2014. Experts within the continent by Professor Akiambayomi Professor Deroma Kinde, Professor Charles Wasungi that will be speaking to us today. And many other professors and experts from different fields came together in 2014 to form GETS. And the main aim of forming the consortium then is to build capacity, influence policy, conduct research, and develop capacity of African countries to cope with emerging infectious disease challenges, epidemics, and pandemics within the region. And that is exactly what we have been doing from 2014 to date. GET has been actively involved in the fight against COVID-19 since January. GET has been involved in capacity building. We've been involved in sensitization, awareness creation, research, and in different other ways to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on the continent of Africa. And one of the things that we are doing is in the area of communication and dialogue. And that is why we are having this webinar today. GET is presently running three webinar sections. The first webinar is based on communication issues around COVID-19 on the continent. The second webinar, we we'll call it Survivors Wednesday. This is a webinar where we give survivors of COVID-19 a platform to share their experience on our, their experience on COVID-19. And the third one is what we're having today. There is focus on impact and response to COVID-19 pandemics in Africa. And today we are having two speakers that will be speaking to us on very important issues. Our first speaker today is Dr. Margaret Ojia Here. Dr. Margaret Ojia Here Dr. Margaret Ojia Here is a consultant psychiatrist 
He's a consultant psychiatrist and a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. She's also the director, stroke co founder of Neltec Menders Health Services, Awareness and Preventive Psychiatric Center located in Jos Plateau, State Nigeria. Dr. Margaret will be speaking to us on the impact of COVID 19 on mental health in Africa. Our second speaker today is Prof. Professor Charles Wisungi. Professor Charles Wisungi is the director of Cochrane South Africa at the Cochrane. South African Medical Research Council. He's also a professor in the Department of Global Health at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Professor Wisonge was previously the Deputy Director of the Center for Evidence-Based Health Care, and he was the head of the Knowledge Transl Translation Unit and head of the Implementation Research Regional Training Center at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Professor Wisungu will be speaking with us on current experimental drugs for COVID-19. We start with, without wasting our time, we'll go straight to the first speaker, Dr. Margaret Oyeri, that will be speaking to us on the impact of COVID-19 on mental issues on the continent. My name is Ayodo Tumbabadwe, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Global Imagine Pathogens Treatment Consortium. Yes. Thank you for joining this webinar, and I leave the floor for Dr. Margaret to give us a presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go on, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Margaret Ojari. Thank you for the kind introduction. I cannot see, I can't see um, the screen from here, but can you see it? Hello, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Hello? Okay, it tells me you're still sharing. Can you can you project it from your end because it's not allowing me share from here. Okay, we will project it now. Just give give us ten seconds. Hello. Hello. Okay, great. Hello. We go. We can see it now. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Can you see Okay. Yes, we can see your screen, please. Hello, Margaret. Please, we can we can see your screen now. Please kindly go. I can see it, guys. Hello. No just responding. Hello. Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you see my screen? Yes. Too? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. So. Yes, I'm we so can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Um. Okay. So thank you for the kind introduction, and so sorry for the hitches that occurred. So I'll be talking on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in Africa, and I'll be going by this outline. Um, so by means of introduction, yes, 2020 was the beginning of a new decade and several people, millions of people around the world had high expectations. They had high hopes for a change. People knew there were going to be changes information technology was going to be on the increase. There's going to be telemedicine in area of health, but very few, very, very few people ever expected an outbreak of such magnitude. Hello. Yeah, hello. It was assumed that it was um, going to clear. But in reality, we have seen that we've seen the impact on a global scale. I just want to remind us of um, some of these definitions that we already know help, instead of physical, mental, and social well being. And not the absence of diseases and infirmities. I'm taking time to um, I've taken time to highlight the physical, mental, and social aspect because a, a number of times people tend to be consigned with diseases and infirmity, and the mental and the social aspect are sidelined. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can Hello. hear you. Okay. Okay. But you can't see your screen. You can't see my screen. Yes. No. Please, can you share it from there? Because I have shared it and oh. it appeared. It was on at first, but it's it's um it's disappeared now. Mm -hmm. All right, it's on now. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry for that. Okay, so a number of times people tend to um, sideline mental and social aspects of health and. Basically, it's a physical component they're concerned about. And that's why I'll give kudos to um, organizers of this program because they have, they're forward looking, forward thinking, and they recognize that the mental component is equally necessary, particularly in a time like this when we are having some form of mental health epidemic that has not yet come to the fore. It appears invisible, but very soon we'll begin to see the consequences of the COVID-19 on the mental health of individuals. This is another definition on mental health. This is just to remind us of um, what, it, what it means. And so that uh, because there's this bias, there is this, um, this misconception that mental illness has to be profound. It has to be something that has to do with hearing voices others can't hear or seeing things others can't see or stripping of self or acting out of form. But the, the, the truth is we have over 200 forms of mental illness and not everyone will actually make people not to function to some extent. So just to remind us that there's some, some subtle forms of mental illness like learning disorders, like sleep, sleep problems and sexual disorders, just to mention a few. I'm coming to Africa, my Africa. Uh, a continent with diverse culture, very rich culture, rich in resources, both natural and human. As it is, Africa provides over 
30% of the um, natural resources of, to the world. So we ought to be a rich continent. But the, 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 the irony of it all is that we ha there's a high poverty index in Africa, high level of illiteracy, inappropriate distribution of resources, but I'll be concentrating on health because that's where I'm going to be talking about, what I'm going to be talking about rather. And um, using Nigeria as a case study, we have inadequate healthcare providers. And this is just in um, Nigeria, which is the most populous African country, we, the federal government, just before the COVID-19, the last report was that um, 40 to 60 million people in Nigeria have some form of mental illness. That was before the COVID-19. That was before I started getting calls. That was for my colleagues across Africa. My colleagues in Nigeria started getting calls, anxiety-driven calls, exac exacerbation of their pre-existing mental illness. So what I'm trying to say here is that these figures have skyrocketed. But because people are in some form of isolation, people are socially restricted, people are scared of nosocomial infections, diseases they can pick up from picking up COVID-19 um, from the hospital, people accessing some form of um, healthcare consultation via te telecommunication technology, we haven't seen it yet. So it appears invisible. But the truth is that prior to the COVID-19, we already had a mental health care crisis. Nigeria with that population of mentally ill people have, has only less than 300 trained qualified psychiatrists. And that is um, being, very, excuse me, being very generous because as it were, some have even left with the brain drain to other countries. And um, African stigma because of our value system, our culture, um, belief pattern, stigma is actually high. We ascribe mental illness to some form of spiritual problems. Um, what we can explain, we give it our own connotation. And the stigma, people with people and carers of people with a mental illness suffer one form of stigma. Let's not talk about the health budget because at the um, 2001 African Union declaration in Abuja, it was agreed that. Um, health budget of all African Union countries should be 15%, at least 15%. But very few countries have implemented that. My dear Nigeria has not gone beyond 5.95 in a long time. I think the highest was about 5.95 in 2012. We oscillate between 3.9 to 4.3. And mental health gets just the, the crumbs of that, 3.3% of that. So we, it's not shocking that there's inadequate um, resources distribution and people have limited access to mental health care. Who can be affected by mental illness? Anybody, anyone that has a brain, that has neurons um, in the brain that the circuitry is working or has neurotransmitters can be affected by a form of mental illness. So when we discriminate, we should be careful because it can happen to anybody. It's an interplay of factors. I just want to remind us of causes of mental illness. It's an interplay of factors, biological, psychological, and environmental factors. We are familiar with this, the, the genes, um, near, um, prenatal damage, maybe um, in utero, the baby had some form of trauma, easier suffocation, or limited oxygen, um, some form of um, toxins like lead and mercury who are contributory, well, are biological factors. Psychological factors like a childhood, like childhood trauma. The child was maybe raped, sexually abused, physically abused, or neglected, not given the appropriate age needs, needs for that age. And um, even the child's, um, even maternal um, loss while the child was still young, or a loss of a parent. There could, it could also be the environmental factors where you have the, 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 so the family, dysfunctional family setting, or a family where there's unemployment and poverty. Poverty and mental illness sort of work hand in hand. They have a bi-directional um, relationship. The person who is poor does not have access to good education to understand that this, this abnormal behavior is as a result of some form of mental illness, knows where to access care, and then they go through particular of care, maybe a traditional healer who, does, who 
doesn't do the right thing and then it gets so severe and eventually the person drinks can't function well and so there's a social drink but i need to stress that it's actually an interplay of factors no it's not standalone because somebody has a genetic load for mental illness does not automatically mean that the person is going to come down mental um illness you have a family member who has depression or schizophrenia doesn't mean that what well, we're going to have it but it has to be an interplay of factors maybe the person has been abused as a child the person now loses his job and then there's a fear of the COVID virus in the air. It's possible the interplay depending on the person's personality and strength. So it's actually a, a mix of all these factors. There are some vulnerable groups that we're going to be looking at in respect to COVID-19. I've said that everybody, anybody can have it. However, children, females, and the older adults, all these people that have listed here, all these groups rather, are they have more likelihood of coming down with this illness. Because when we look at children, children, are, they need a certain level of predictability. They need a certain level of structure. However, because of the disruption in their routine, disruption in their normal pattern, go to school, come home, play, study, or go to sleep, watch movies, something, that has been abruptly taken away. And they are feeling and looking out for answers. They are looking at the adults and the carers around them. And they are like sponge, they absorb our emotions. Some will manifest with being clingy, bedwetting, or, or being irritable, having mood, I'm uh, sorry, um, disruption in their appetite and um, their eating patterns. For the older ones, they might become more, more fixed, fixated, binging on, on Netflix or games. And those are the ways, they, 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 those are ways in which they handle their their own emotions. So it's important that you have, we create a loving environment, create a supportive environment where we listen. However, this cannot be all be, this cannot be possible in all cases because we have some children in the IDP camps. We have children who have been abused, who are in an environment where they are, they are being um, violated and now they are stuck with their perpetrators in the same place. So this is going to increase. Likewise, women with suffering from um, intimate partner violence. Um, other adults are used to, well, in Africa, we still have the um, extended family thing, um, but um, with this lockdown, there's been a restriction on, on that. We, the older adults or the elderly can't go to their social garden, maybe the church, maybe the religious, the religious garden where they go to, or they are um, seeing their family members come visiting frequently. That has been taken away, and then their minds tend to get lonely. And... Um, begin to wonder what is it in this world why should they be why should they still hang around what what's your value what what what's in this for them that sense of belonging has been taken away and this could predispose them to um some more severe uh, mental illness like depression for those with pre-existing mental illness they might have they might be cut off from their routine drugs which is going to see their um, um healthcare service providers it's likewise and uh, people who have an existing mental illness like hypertension, diabetes, it's been said that all the other diseases have fled, but they haven't actually fled, they are actually dead. People are just scared of going to the hospitals. First responders and frontline workers have their challenges too. They are concerned about their own health. Will they catch the infection? What's going to happen? They get to have to triage, they get to have to choose who gets what, who is more critical, who should they address, and they have to be careful so they don't infect their family members. These are all concerns that they have. Okay, that those who have been confirmed with COVID-19, those ones are equally worried, or rather, I'm sorry, these people are equally worried that are they going to make it out? They've heard of people who have died, and then they're alone, they can't be with their family members. And those are all things that could predict.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think there is, there is a problem with Dr. Maggie's network. She has gone offline. Okay, I can see her, she's back. Her system is muted. Can the host please unmute her? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, please. Yeah, I'm so sorry, I, my network is... Um... Okay, so I was talking about the social problems. I have spoken about the direct ones, the efforts trying to mitigate, um, the measures we have put in place to mitigate the virus, like social distancing, physical distancing, isolation, in as much as it's helping to curtail the spread, is also worsening economic problems and um, security problems. It's only that who, someone who has eaten that can stay indoors and listen to don't go outside, safe distancing and all that. So these are some of the ripple effects of the COVID virus on individuals and how it can play out on our mental health. This is um, just a picture depicting that. This is some picture from Africa. You can see that social distance is not respected. Some are wearing a mask, but people have to go and look for what to eat. So what are the mental health problems that we should, we, we should expect or we might see more often? Like um, I said earlier, we're having more anxiety-driven um, cases. We're having people call us, having problems of um, panic attack, they don't can't, they just suddenly wake up with that fear of death. They have problems breathing, their chest is tight, and they're having tingling sensations, all forms of symptoms. Some are mimicking, some are having symptoms which mimic the COVID 19, where they have, um, they just feel they have the COVID virus. And some have gone to the extent of going to get themselves screened and they come back negative, but they still believe that this thing is that they have the virus and they need to have psychotherapy to really work on them. And some have had to be placed on drugs. So these are some of them. The pressure we know, it's one of the most recent um, mental health conditions. Loneliness, fear, and apprehension aren't actually mental health conditions, but they are psychological forms of psychological distress which could predispose to all these other ones. Um, the obsessive compulsive disorder we are seeing because of wash your hands regularly, um, make sure you wash for like 20 minutes and wash it when you've taught this. Some people who already had that predilection to um, obsessive compulsive disorder are now having an exacerbation of that. And some people are developing it. We have the stress related disorders. Some are using maladaptive coping techniques and using substance to escape from their problems. I mentioned that intimate partner violence and child abuse have been on the increase. So what are the interventions that um, we can do to curtail this? Um, there are several interventions, but the main thing is, it's just an overview of everything. It should target everyone. Everyone should be involved. It's multidisciplinary, it's multisectorial, right from the person in the isolation ward up to the general public. Everybody's involved. Government of different countries should be committed to making it work. There should be inter-regional, inter-national collaborations and then the establishment of favorable health policies. And um, strategies that appear to be working should also be made to be disseminated to other countries. And so we're going to be looking at it um, briefly at different levels, the individual, vulnerable groups, um, communities which involve the families, the workplace, the schools, and then the policymakers. So I'm starting with the policymakers, the, the highest level of government, um, lawmakers in, of, the, of the different countries. It's important that we anticipate, like um, the organizers of this forum have anticipated that it's likely there's going to be an epidemic. It's likely there's going to be a pandemic soon of mental health disorders beyond COVID-19. Let's do something. So it's important to anticipate. And I like the fact that from Ebola, um, after the Ebola crisis that ravaged some parts of Africa, this consortium was, um, was um, established to ensure that they could put some things in place. And that's beautiful to anticipate and prepare because the Ebola had sort of sensitized us in Africa to get our acts together and get things on ground. However, it saddens one that 
sometimes these things don't, don't come to light. So it's important to anticipate, prepare for an increase in mental health problems like it's being done now. And um, we might not have enough data, data but there's a study that a couple of my colleagues and I did, and, we noticed, and in that study, 90%, 90.5% percent of people who who have been exposed to the group of our participants rather reported that they had some form of mental health problem. So we can see that this is on increase beyond we just having call getting calls to to reflect as such. And then we need to be proactive. We need to collaborate with all civil societies, individual, and there's a place for psychological first aid. We shouldn't wait for the mental health practitioners to be the ones involved. It's important that the government, civil societies empower individuals, lay people, to be able to administer this immediate response, treat um, um, response to people who have, might have been traumatized and want to do, and direct them to the appropriate um, help centers. And then it's important also to ensure continuous on-site and online psychological support. There was a committee that was set up recently, and I realized that no psychologist or psychiatrist was involved. And it was the committee that had to do with COVID-19. And I thought it was actually sad because that means they're not anticipating that he's going to have a mental health problem or there are mental health problems involved. But it's important because even at the, in, there are different levels on, in the isolation world, where the people who are infected, who have severe symptoms, there has to be an on-site trained qualified or, or rather trained, maybe not qualified because you're on the staff now, but trained to be able to administer some form of psychological um, support. Likewise, for those who have some mild symptoms, but for those who are uh, not showing symptoms, who are just contact, or people who are in the, not frontline workers, it might be psychological, um, online treatment might just be okay. Having um, teleconferencing, WhatsApp call, WhatsApp video might just be, um, appropriate for such um, individuals. And that's, it's also important that um, policymakers ensure that they enable tele telemedicine platform. We already have that going. Psychiatry has embraced that. A lot of psychiatrists are doing that now. However, it will be um, beneficial if we had established platforms that could cover a broader range, a broader range. We could get to the communities beyond people who can afford um, to pay for data. And then Fabric, one thing we've been pushing for in Nigeria is the mental health bill. The Association of Psychiatrists of Nigeria has been pushing for that because when the bill is established and is passed into law, um, the stigma is going to protect and promote mental health. At the same time, it's going to reduce stigma and discrimination and it's going to ensure that there's better distribution of resources and manpower. So um, those are some of the things that um, the um, um, policymakers can do also scale up budget allocation. If we can get to the 15%, that will help mental health and health in general. So there are individual strategies. Um, it's important that everybody takes responsibility of our mental health. It is we're in a collective state of trauma. Everybody is affected to some level. It's our level of resilience. It's our personality that might play out here. So we need to be careful what we listen to, the sources, there's so much information. The media is awash with so much information. Uh, the, you are seeing it part time just to ensure that everybody gets to know what's going on. But at the same time, how long, how much more, how much can people handle? So it's important you check, maybe once a day or twice a day, at some time of the day you know what's going on and then you make sure it's from a reliable source. Because mischief makers are also trying to send um, a lot of fake news and misinformation. Stay um, healthy, eat healthy rather, exercise, deep breathing, and then it's important to avoid maladaptive coping techniques, such as um, using alcohol or some sort of drugs to, to escape. If you are on medication, it's important also that um, you continue your medication, communicate, get in touch with your healthcare provider and maintain your support system is very important. You might not be able to see the person physically, but you can take calls, you can call the person, check the person, and um, we, we, we all owe ourselves checking on each other to make sure that we're all doing fine. These are some of the frontline workers. Um, they also have their own challenges. I've mentioned it. I've mentioned the women too, intimate partner violence. The healthcare workers are worried that they might um, they might get infected, they might um, also infect others. 
And employers have a role to play too. They need to ensure that they create a conducive environment, supportive environment where the communication lines are open, where workers can reach out. And um, unfortunately, with the global economic crunch, um, everywhere there is, um, there is a down, well, not downsizing, but revenue pays of um, employees are dropping, employers are dropping, employees are dropping rather. And so it's inevitable that they'll be downsizing to some extent, but it will be important, it will be beneficial if um, there could be policies or some form of palliative to cushion this um, fall. However, we owe ourselves the um, onus of keeping ourselves safe. And even if you happen to be one of the individuals who will lose your job, it's important that you create a semblance of what you had before and think out of the box. What's, what this is, we are entering the new normal. What can, I, what can I generate out of this? How can I become relevant in the new, in the new normal? Moving forward and um, maintaining the individual coping um, techniques to remain deliberately safe, if I can use the word. In conclusion, um, the growing fears and uncertainties that uh, are surrounding the COVID-19 virus, the nature of the pandemic continues to fuel different forms of psychological distress that invariably will lead to some form of mental illness. And it's obvious that there's a new wave of pandemic in the form of mental health. Um, it appears visible for now, but when the isolation and this, the COVID, um, the impact of the COVID-19 has subsided, we we'll begin to see this. It is said that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. We need to get all hands on deck. Together, we are stronger. It's important to also remind us that it's normal to feel anxious and have some funny symptoms. Everybody's passing through some form. But when you feel you can't cope anymore, please reach out. There are help lines that you can get to. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Maggie, for that wonderful presentation. You've touched a lot of things, and I'm sure a lot of people on the platform you have one or two questions to ask you. We have questions at the end of the, after the second presenter has made his presentation, you can kindly raise your hand and you'll be allowed to ask your questions. Or you can send us a chat and we're going to read your questions out. Without wasting our time, let me go straight to the second presenter, Professor Charles Rusungi that I've introduced at the beginning of the webinar. Professor Charles, I can see you online. Can you please give us your, your presentation? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dotun. I, I will also, in case I also have problems with projecting on the day, I will also send you now my a copy while I send you and while I start presenting, just in case I get connection problems from here. Okay, please go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one second, let me send this to you and then I will go start. Uh, and that should give people the time to start thinking of questions for uh, the very excellent presentation on uh, uh, mental health. Okay, it is quite large, so maybe I will just go ahead from here. Okay, please go on.
Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to, to talk. So if you can see, I, I am assuming that you can see my slides, but if you can, let me know. Yes, you can see, Prof. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the COVID, uh, current experimental drugs for COVID-19. And I thank you so much for inviting me. And I've learned a lot from the presentation on mental health. Thank you so much. So I work for the Cochrane South Africa, which is, part, which is the research department of the South African Medical Research Council. And my, our organization, the South African Medical Research Council, the mission is to improve the health of South Africa and the quality of life of people who live in South Africa by conducting and funding relevant and responsive health research, development, innovation, and research translation. And I've provided here a link to our website. And I encourage everybody to read this and very interesting organization. Also, the, this, this research unit of the South African Medical Research Council is also part of the Cochrane collaboration. And Cochrane is an international uh, network of more than 65,000 volunteers from 130 countries whose mission is to promote evidence-informed health decision-making by producing high-quality, relevant, accessible, systematic reviews and other forms of synthesized evidence. And I want to make a disclaimer here that the views expressed in this presentation are mine and they do not necessarily reflect those of my employers as either the South African Medical Research Council or Cochrane or any other organization for that matter that I am associated with. So when we talk about testing uh, drugs, uh, testing, uh, we're talking about experimental drugs uh, that brings into mind research about uh, studies to test these drugs. And when we talk about testing treatment, the, I've just uh, illustrated here what for, I, see, I just want to block my email so that my email don't cloud the sky. <laughs> so for the best, uh, various treatments, various uh, study designs, are adapted for various kinds of ver, ver, various kinds of uh, research questions, and the best uh, research design, the, the best study design for the testing treatments for testing health intervention is a randomized trial. And in this type of study, people are located by chance at random to either an intervention or a comparison. If we were testing to uh, a treatment for COVID, for example, maybe it is called oranges, and want to compare it to something else, maybe apples, then we will randomly take people to be on the apple's arm and the others on the orange arm, and then we we'll follow them over time to see if they will develop the outcome of interest. And this uh, is called the randomized trial. And actually, the uh, things around randomization, they haven't started now. The randomized, the first uh, reported trial, and I think that's the one I've found, was actually, is actually in the Holy Bible, in Daniel from chapter one, verses one to 16. Here, there is a comparison of vegetables and fruits to people who were eating the king's delicacies, lots of uh, meat and wine. And in the end, actually, it was shown that vegetables and fruits were better than those things. So this is one of my side, the first one that I've come across. And also even in medicine, there was one, the first one, that one of the very first ones was when uh, James Lynn do, uh, 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 was, he, he was in the, these ships, they see that a lot of people had uh, scurvy, and then he assigned two sailors to receive one of six treatments that were then in use for COVID. And you can see uh, they are listed here. There was cider, sulfuric acid, vinegar, seawater, nutmeg, and lemons and oranges. And when he followed them, it actually shows that lemon and oranges were better. 
This was not a very fancy trial, but at least it proved the principle that you can compare people doing different things and find out the right answer. And so let's come back to COVID before I forget. <laughs> So the, uh, I can, for trials, I've mentioned randomized trials because they are the best uh, way of testing treatments. Now, uh, ethically, when somebody is conducting a randomized trial, you need to have a protocol first, and this needs to be registered in what is called a prospective registry. So that at the end, people can follow up and find out maybe when you do the, the, the trial, you, might, you say upfront that you are going to test to see whether maybe your outcome will be death, your outcome will be disease, your outcome might be whatever it is, but you put that up front, you register that in a prospective registry so that somewhere along the line, people can find out if what happened to that study and what you found. And if you decide not to report some outcomes, people can actually come back and say, why did you not report this? And it has been found that people often, when they find the uh, results, that are not, when they set out some of these studies, they find results that are not uh, what they were expecting, what are usually called negative studies, that they don't publish them. Or if they find something else along the line, if they wanted to test the effect of a particular treatment or for treating COVID uh, on death, and in the end, they find that they, either the treatment that they didn't like was causing more death, but then they find one other outcome where that treatment was uh, probably more favorable, then they would probably tend to report only that. And then we would be, we would not, we would be blinded from what the full uh, story was. That is why there is something now called the prospective uh, clinical trial registration. There are many, uh, many of these. In Africa, we have the Pan-African Clinical Trials Registry, which is run from Cochrane, South Africa. There's also the South African National Clinical Trials Registry, which is also run from uh, Cochrane, South Africa. There are a few other registries that are uh, ongoing in, uh, in Africa, and I think Nigeria is setting up one. So, and all of these uh, registries, like the Pan-African Clinical Trials Registry, they feed data to the World Health Organization. There is a platform called the International Clinical Trials Registry Platform where they feed data on a regular basis. And where if you search on this platform, which is shown here, you can then find out the ICA TRP. You can find out all the trials that have been registered around the world on anything. Uh, it could be COVID-19, it could be any study that is ongoing. And I think uh, there are people, uh, uh, if you have questions about this clinical trials registration, I'm hoping that one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dudu, is, uh, following this uh, presentation and she can answer all those questions. If not, I can also uh, link people to the uh, information around that. And this actually on this slide shows you the number of trials. So they have been, we have a pandemic of COVID-19, but there is also a pandemic, an epidemic of trials going on, an epidemic of research, which is good because we need to test and find things before we do them and not just do them because we think that they are right. And you can see starting from the 10th of February, there were 27 uh, trials registered. And as of the 11th of May, there have been 2,369 trials that are being conducted around the world on COVID-19, which is a good thing. So some of these, most of these trials are around various things around for treating COVID. There might be about nine of them that are around uh, vaccines for, that are testing at uh, candidate vaccine uh, uh, that are ongoing. But most of them are around treatment. And these are some of the treatment, the uh, drugs that are, be, that are being used. So the various uh, are, are, are testing remdesivir versus placebo. There are various, there, is, uh, the, there are also some that are testing uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which is well known to so, uh, the, us, a lot of us in Africa, we've used chloroquine, neuroquine for treatment of malaria for a long time. There's a lot of resistance around that, but this is a drug that's well known in many parts of Africa. And there are also various antiviral, uh, antiretroviral drugs like lopinavir, ritonavir, and, uh, and in various combinations that people are testing around. There is interferon that people are also testing. Then there are, uh, there are various other factors uh, uh, Fabipiravir, some of these uh, names are very exciting, but those are very 
the drugs that are being tested. There are a lot, uh, even the various antibiotics, erythromycin, is also one of them that people are testing sometimes uh, uh, in combination with hydroxychloroquine. So these uh, studies are going on now, and I would choose uh, just two of them to show where this, uh, what is currently happening around that. And the first one is remdesivir. I think last week, the, so remdesivir is a, a product of an adenosine analog that has a broad antiviral spectrum, including uh, coronaviruses. So it's uh, thought to uh, have antiviral properties for various of this, but what is important to us is uh, coronaviruses. In vitro, uh, remdesivir has been shown to inhibit all human and animal coronaviruses that have been tested to death. And this include uh, the, uh, the, the one responsible for COVID-19. It has also been shown uh, antiviral and clinical effects in animal models for the, uh, the SARS uh, coronavirus one and the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome uh, infections. So that is why it was thought that maybe this uh, could be tested in trials in human. As of now, one remdesivir trial has been published, and this involved 237 uh, uh, patients with confirmed severe COVID-19 uh, disease that were admitted to 10 centers in China. This was published uh, recently in The Lancet, and this is the, the, the name of the first author, Wang. And also, uh, last week, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, who, has now who, who, of course, has always been a very famous infectious disease uh, expert in the U.S., but has also become so fam famous again because he is part of uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, task force. And he, he announced uh, last week, I think, that another trial involving 1,063 1, uh, patients sponsored by the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases has been completed. But we, uh, that one has, as of now, we haven't seen the results yet. So let me just go a bit into what the, uh, the one from uh, China found. So uh, they started off with about 255 uh, participants who were screened. They enrolled 237 participants into this study, and they then uh, randomized uh, 158 participants to receive uh, remdesivir, and then uh, they randomized 70, uh, 79 to receive uh, placebo. Among those, who uh, the 79 who were assigned to placebo, one of them withdrew, so they had 158 who were taking remdesivir and 78 uh, who were on the placebo arm. And if you look down there, three of the people who were assigned remdesivir did not uh, start the study drug. So finally, there were about 155 people who started the, the study drug and 78 who were on placebo. And for various reasons, five in the, I'm just giving these details so that uh, this study and the, and the findings there. And in, in the end, so they have, uh, 155 people who took the, the drug, 78 who were in the placebo group. But we also have having evidence-based medicine, something called intention to treat analysis. What intention to treat analysis means is that if in a trial, if you have assigned somebody to a treatment group, that person must only be analyzed in that treatment group. And that is very important because some people might assign somebody into one treatment group to one drug, and since they don't like the drug, or for some reason they take the person to a different group. And if you start doing that, the findings that you have will not be valid. So in intention to treat analysis, once you have assigned somebody to a particular uh, drug, that person must be analyzed in that group to avoid uh, uh, biases or systematic uh, uh, errors. So this is just a, a, a table from that study that compared the various uh, clinical outcomes, the time to clinical improvement, the duration of invasive uh, intubation, and various things that they looked to. And in this study, what they have actually found is that, well, it was stopped early because you know, in, 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 in China, there might be a second wave now, but the, the the number of cases reduced and they could not con uh, continue this study 
when they arrive only at the 237. But what they found from there is that, and this is also just showing now doing the, the time from the start of the study to show people who are uh, to just uh, survival in this study, and uh, you you still see that there's not much uh, difference between the, uh, the improvement in the remdesiv uh, group, which is the one in red, and the placebo people who are just taking something that essentially contained nothing inside. There was no difference, and for all the other outcome, there was no difference in uh, between uh, remdesiv and placebo. What they conclude in this study, and this is just giving a bit more detail, since this is one of the drugs that is uh, of interest, uh, I, I just wanted to go a bit into det uh, detail of this. So between February 6 and March 12, patients were enrolled into this study and were assigned to either receive remdesivir or uh, placebo. And the remdesivir use was not associated with a difference in time to clinical uh, imp improvement. And for various other outcomes, there was no uh, difference. But there were adverse events were reported in 102 uh, people, 66% of the people who were in the remdesivir group, and also 50% uh, of the people who, uh, 50, which is 64% of the people who were in the placebo group, and I, I just said uh, previously that this was stopped early because of uh, the decrease in the number of cases. But actually, one of the main reasons why they stopped it was because of the severe adverse events that were noted in 18 of the people in the remdesivir group compared to only four in the other group. So in conclusion from this study, quite small, there's no evidence of a beneficial effect of remdesivir. But the other one that I mentioned that uh, Dr. Tony Fauci talked about, what Dr. Fauci said was that there was uh, the time to the, the uh, improvement uh, to cure, to discharge from hospital was uh, shorter in the people who took uh, remdesivir. And I think it was about 12, uh, 12 days compared to about 16 days in the other group. So there was about 36, 30% uh, uh, reduction in the time to discharge when you were on remdesivir. But this has not yet been published, so we don't have the details. So uh, what is currently available, remdesivir, there's no difference between remdesivir and placebo. So based on this, it cannot be uh, recommended. The other drug that is of interest that I wanted to talk about is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are widely used in the treatment of malaria. They used to be, but in some places, people still take uh, chloroquine for the treatment of malaria and also rheumatic uh, diseases for hydroxychloroquine. They have been suggested as effective treatments for COVID-19 on the grounds of both their anti-inflammatory and antiviral effects. Recently, on the 30th of March 2020, the United States Food and Drug Administration issued an emergency use authorization saying that these drugs could be used in the treatment of patients who are not in, enrolled in clinical trials. So far, there have been three small clinical trials that have been conducted, all in China, that assess the effect of uh, hydroxychloroquine in people with moderate or severe COVID. And there is a website which is shown here now. It is covidstrokenma.com. Uh, uh, and they, what this site does is that they are tracking all the studies that are being conducted and published around uh, uh, COVID-19, especially the trials, and putting the information there that people and, and I will encourage people who want to see what is happening there. In addition to looking at the ongoing trials in the International Clinical Trials Registry Platform through the WHO, this site also uh, includes uh, try, uh, try the publication results from trials and this. So you, they could be complementary, or if you had to look, look at this one, you could also see what the results are. So what have those three small trials that have been done in China, what have they found? The first trial, just you will see that there were only 30 uh, participants in this. And in this one, they are looking at the incidence of viral negative conversion. And you see there is no difference, but this is a very small trial. There was 
if, if you are reading much into what is shown there in the risk ratio, they're showing that there is a 30% a, a uh, reduction with uh, hydroxy uh, chloroquine, which is varies from a 27% uh, reduction to an 18% increase. But with this type of very small trials, you cannot really read much into, uh, into this. So this was the second trial, which had, I think this one had about, uh, it was still about the same size. It doesn't here, now this one is still not yet published, but it is in one of the, the, the preprint from there shows that it is also a very small trial, I'm sure only about 30 or even a small amount. And this one is looking at the time to negativity too for, for this, and it, there's still uh, no difference. And you will not really expect much from such a very small trial. I haven't shown the, the result from the TED trial because it is essentially the same. So the currently conducted trials are very small. There are three very small trials. So we could look at uh, other evidence that's, uh, that's, that's available there. Early, uh, early this month, the, the, there was a, a geologist from the, and colleagues reported on the association between hydroxychloroquine use and intubation or death at a large medical center in uh, New York City. This was recently, I think last week, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In this cohort study involving 1,446 patients, this is of course much larger than the trials that have been conducted with COVID-19, who had been admitted to hospital, hydroxychloroquine administration was not associated with either a greatly uh, lowered or an increased rate of uh, composite uh, endpoints of intubation or death. So when they looked at people who were intubated and those who died, there was really no difference between the two. Either it, it, it didn't favor uh, the no treatment, it didn't favor the hydroxychloroquine uh, arm. And I would just want to show in the next slide again, just to show, this is a table taken from this study. And it shows, if you look at the number of events, all those events combined in the either intubation or death, in the hydroxychloroquine arm, there were 262 people who either died or were intubated out of the 111 in this arm. For the people who didn't take hydroxychloroquine, 84 of them were either died or were intubated, and there were 565 people in this group. And when you look at the, just comparing that, when you look at the, just the crude analysis, it might actually be showing there that there was actually a bit more harm in the hydroxychloroquine arm. But when, because this was not a randomized trial, you know, there might be certain things that were in the group that took hydroxychloroquine that were not in the group that did not take. So they did various multi-level analysis to try to control and adjust for these various other things that might be there. And when you do that, you find that the difference is not, there's no difference between the two. And for various other, uh, various other ways that they try to look at their analysis, there was no difference between those taking hydroxychloroquine and those uh, who took uh, no, no treatment. I also want to show in the various, the, my colleague, uh, Dr. Credo from uh, our center, is also in, involved with uh, a, a group at our National Department of Health, our Ministry of Health, where they synth we synthesize evidence on everything coming out to be able to advise our decision makers, the minister. And this, and this was also a review looking at the hydroxychloroquine, uh, the effect of hydroxychloroquine that they did combining all of this, and they essentially arrive at the same uh, answer from what is available, that, that there is uh, uh, currently insufficient evidence to, recomm uh, to recommend routine use of hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in children or adults with COVID. Okay, so if there, there's still need for randomized trials to be conducted. So I've, I, I just want to indicate some of this uh, that I sh uh, slide that I showed earlier. So the, in addition to remdesivir and chloroquine, there are still uh, various uh, antiretroviral drugs that are being tested, but none of this has been proven to be effective yet. So and in case you are not yet impressed with my presentation, I want to impress you with some of uh, the citations from my from some of my publications and. That was probably a joke to just see whether people are still 
uh, people are still there because my screen is full and I can't see whether uh, I am still connected or not. I might just be talking to an empty screen, but I think I am. you guys are still there or else somebody would have sent me already a, a WhatsApp. So what the message that this slide is showing is that irrespective of the type of study, irrespective of the question, I've told you that when you are doing uh, for various types of health questions, different types of studies are relevant, study designs are relevant. If you want things around maybe feelings or people's emotions, maybe a qualitative studies are best uh, indicated. But if you want to test uh, interventions like vaccines or treatment, then randomized control trials are more applicable. But the message to take from that is that one study, no matter how big or how well conducted, would not tell as much a study as if you have combined various studies on a particular topic. So a combination, a good summary of all the studies on a particular topic, whether be it a drug, be it a vaccine, be it whatever it is, tells a better story, story than one uh, of the included studies taken uh, separately. So what I've put here is that systematic reviews, and we call the, such uh, summary systematic reviews. So, uh, systematic reviews lead to the identification of areas where evidence is lacking, thereby assisting researchers and research funders to chart methodical paths for future primary research. And also, systematic reviews have an inherent ability to minimize bias, which are systematic errors or chance, which are random errors, in the assessment of existing research, as well as provide uh, a means for policymakers to assess all available evidence on key questions in a judicious manner. What I'm saying here is that as news, as studies are coming up on, ver uh, on various drugs for treating COVID or any uh, uh, disease for that matter, there should be a summary, a well-conducted synthesis of all those studies in order to find out what uh, the evidence is saying, because if there's only two small studies or one study says this and another one says that, unless you combine them in an appropriate way, you will not know what the real story is. And I just want to thank all of you. Ngiabonga Kaku. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. Thank Are you, you still there? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, bro. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prof, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you to for our listeners uh, that have stayed with us almost all now listening to the presentations. We've had the two presentations, the first one from Dr. Mackey and the second one from Professor Charles, and they've made very important statements. Uh, Dr. Maggie made a statement that we have about 60 million people that has one form of mental illness or the other within the country. That is scary. And she, she said we have, we have less than 300 trained psychiatrists. Imagine to cater 300 people to cater for 160 million cases. That is, that is overwhelming. Like the Americans would say, that's crazy. And, and she said anybody can be affected by mental illness, by level of mental illness or the other. So we have to be very careful when we are discriminating. And Professor Charles has also said a lot of things, started with the Bible, the first clinical trials in the book of Daniel. We went on to list the clinical, the present drugs they are using for treating COVID. And also explain some trials, clinical trials that have been carried out. So I know we have people that, that want to ask questions, and I can see, already see questions on the Zoom chat. What we're going to do is, if you have a question, kindly raise your hand and we'll call you to speak. Or you can type it on the Zoom chat and I, I'm going to read the questions out. But let me start from myself. My first question is, is to Professor Charles. You listed the, the drugs that they were current, they are currently using for COVID-19, for treating COVID-19. But it shocked me that I did not see any of the drugs that were made in Africa. In the list of drugs that you listed, 
Is it that the drugs, and I'm sure there's some drugs, especially the one from Madagascar that is going around now that even some countries, including Nigeria, Nigeria have ordered, is it that there's no, there's no clinical trials on that drug or because the drug is from Africa, it's not recognized as one of the drugs that can be used to treat COVID-19? Okay. You, I, you, you must be very good, uh, Dotunda. You can look at those names and then know which one came from Africa. <laughs> that is a joke. <laughs> but I, I think that we, I, I've also heard about the, um, the, the drug from uh, Madagascar and they have come off with all, with all of this. I, I don't think that any of those has already been registered in the... Um, that there are any trials going on on those ones that we are aware, that we are aware of, and I will also just see if there's anybody who has more information about that on among the audience who can let us do. So it's not because they are not from Africa. I think the trials might still be going on, or there might be room for uh, trials to be conducted around that. And like you said, the fact that there are no trials yet might not be, it doesn't mean that the drugs don't work, it's just that the information is not out there. Just like the various other experimental drugs that you've seen there, like even hydroxychloroquine, which the US was already seeing, there was already an emergency use authorization. The current evidence coming out is showing that it is not effective. So, and there might be others, the way the evidence would eventually show that they are effective. And I, I, I am hoping and praying that any of this, like the Madagascar drug and the others, will be uh, the effective ones. But unless you test them, you will not know. And I think there are efforts going on around things of, uh, where to test some of those drugs. And there might be efforts already. I know, like uh, you talked about the uh, Nigeria contacting Madagascar already. I think there might also be contacts at a more higher level here in South Africa where, to try to test some of those drugs. So as of now, I'm not aware that there are clinical trials registered on those ones taking place in, in Africa, but it's an encouragement that people should actually test uh, these drugs uh, using clearly defined methods so that we can also have confidence that they do work. But in desperate situations, we can use desperate measures, but we need to get evidence. Okay, thank you, Prof, for that, for that response. Um, questions here, which I'm going to read three questions, then I allow Dr. Maggie and Professor Charles to respond. To respond. First question is, for, Professor, for Dr. Maggie. As you mentioned, survivors may face stigmatization when re-entering their communities. Is the issue of with stigmatization the same, with COVID, the same for COVID-19 survivors as it was for Ebola survivors in 2014? That's the first question. The next question is, the mental well-being of an individual has a lot to do with ease or productivity. If a sizable, num sizable number of people suffers, suffer mental illness as a fallout of COVID-19 pandemic, definitely it will affect the general productivity of the country. Are there any, is there any country or countries with, with blueprints to tackle the multiplier effect of COVID-19 on its economy? That is the second question. Second question. Let me take the third one, then the presenters will react. Thank you for the great presentations, highlighting the importance of mental health. Professor Wisonge shared with us the importance of systemic reviews. Thank you. Okay, that's a comment. So I think we should respond to the two questions before we go to the next set of questions. Dr. Maggie, can you respond first? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the first question that had to do with um, stigma. If comparing both um, Ebola virus disease and the, um, the COVID-19 disease, um, it's not, if I got the question right, who was comparing if there is the same magnitude of stigma? Yes. Well, okay. Well, I will categorically say yes or no, because 
we need to have evidence to support this. So not much um, research has been done to compare. However, um, it is particularly in Africa, we are just beginning to see the effects on, on uh, we're beginning to see the effects of the COVID-19 on individuals. So we can't say categorically now because um, the, what, what, what stigma really sprouts from um, a point, a place of, of what people cannot explain, they give their own connotation to it, and that's what happens to mental illness too. So they don't understand what is going on here, but they know that it's very infective. So, so stay away from us. We don't want to be infected. So there are there are, um, some isolated cases of some communities that have um, stigmatized some people who were taken back into their communities in Africa, where they're like, no, don't come here. You're the um, you are, you're going to infect the community, you are cost and all that. And it comes from a place of um, poor awareness and also from poverty. But um, using a country like Nigeria now, a lot of this lockdown, the mitigation uh, measures, the lockdown and the social distancing, people are more interested in a country that has over 69% of its population living below the poverty line. Stigma is the least of their problem right now. The lockdown is their problem. And they haven't really come in contact with so much, so many people with the virus. So, or no people who have had the virus, it's only the allied somewhat that they are aware of. So it's not an immediate problem for them. What they are, they are contending with now is how to get food in their bellies and how to ensure that they have a, some, somehow something that resembles their previous lifestyle. So we are not seeing so much of the stigma in Nigeria yet, but I remember the Ebola, May perhaps also because there's so much awareness concerning the COVID-19. It's a pandemic, unlike Ebola, which just affected some countries in, in um, Africa. So there's so much awareness and there's so much information on the need to show empathy, to applaud people who are putting their lives in the, in the, on the line to save people. So the stigma really is not so much. I would say it's not as much. In my own opinion, I stand to be corrected though, and I'd like to do more, maybe it's a, um, it's a call to do more research. But in my own opinion, I will say no, the stigma is not so much because there's empathy and people are commending people who have put their lives on the line for them. Just a few cases that have been reported in some communities, or like the Ebola virus, we are even in Nigeria, though we didn't have so much cases, the people who survived were stigmatized, some were laid off from work, and some were castigated in their communities. I hope I've answered that question. And um, for the other one that has to do with blueprint, it's, an, it's a virus or a disease that is there, it's, people, it's just been unraveled. You, we're having research that are supporting and contradicting themselves. So for now, there ain't any blueprints that any country or region can come out and say, this is working for us. What, what is going on is um, it's just a work in progress. People are still experimenting and saying, okay, it appears that this seems to have worked for China. It appears this has worked for South Korea. Maybe we could replicate it. Okay, it worked for South Korea, but it's not working in Italy, that kind of thing. So categorically, no, there's no blueprint, but it's, yes, you are right in saying that if the mental health of um, individuals are affected, it will definitely affect productivity. So that's why um, I couldn't talk so much because I had network issues and I also was mindful of the time. But employers are encouraged to ensure that their employees actually have um, uh, their mental health is catered for so that they get so they get value. Not that they, because when the person breaks down, of course, you know, they're going to be absenteeism from work and there's going to be decreased productivity. So it's important that um, we as employers or as employers, yes, our workplaces, we should ensure that we look out for our employees. Likewise, um, that's why it's recommended that palliatives and um, support systems are put in place so that the downsizing in different sectors because of the economic crunch wouldn't be so profound. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hello. Maggie. Thank you, Hello. Dr. Maggie, for, for that. Beautiful answers. We have, I have two questions here for Professor 
Professor Charles, and we'll take it quickly for a round of the webinar today. The first question is from BC Bright's Live Liveware Initiative. And our question is strict, is direct. She said, chloroquine and adrosyl chloroquine are effective and safe. They are using overdose in US. We have drawn up study protocols for COVID-19 response in Africa. We need to run trials. Are you willing to run a systemic review? Thank you. As from BC Bright Live Well Initiative. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want me to respond quickly? Uh, yes, this let, can... me, let me answer. Let me OK, answer. you can go to the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a pertinent question is what are the criteria that qualify drugs, a drug for clinical trials? I think you can take the two together. Professor Charles, can, can you respond to the two together? Yes, let me, I, I can go. Thank you so much and thank BC for the, for the questions. Definitely, I would be willing to collaborate with you on a systematic review, but currently uh, in Cochrane, we have a protocol for a systematic review, so there's an ongoing systematic review. And I think one of the questions that we have to look at would also be subgrouping them by the doses of the, the various studies by the doses that we are used to see if there might be, like you said, in the US using an overdose, so that might be a possibility. So the, if you can, I can send you the protocol and more information around that. If through that, you can send me, if I have your contact details, your email. And then the other question about the trials, you know, there are various, definitely there are criteria for what makes a good um, trial. And I can also send that information offline and also uh, additional material if it's needed. But I would be happy to collaborate on a systematic review or at least provide the resources and help anybody who wants to conduct a systematic review to do a, a systematic review. That is what Cochrane is there for. Currently, we are the only Cochrane Center in, in, in Africa, but we, there is a, a, a branch, an associate center in Calabar in Nigeria. They do a lot of systematic reviews and support people to do systematic reviews. There are various hubs in various parts uh, of Africa, and I think some people on the call here are already also doing systematic reviews or have expertise. So there is a help out there. If there's somebody who wants to do a systematic review, has a question that we can look out for. And there may already be a systematic review and we can send the information and summarize that. So we, we, the people just need to get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. I hope this is satisfied with, you, with, you, with that answer. If not, I, can, I will give you Professor Charles' email address. You can continue this discussion by email. Yeah, we'll spend almost one hour, 30 minutes on this program. And, uh, and I want to say a big thank you to our presenters today, Professor Charles and Dr. Maggie, for this wonderful, for those wonderful presentations. Thank you very much. And for, our for those that have stayed with us for almost one hour, 30 minutes listening, I believe you've gained so much from these presentations. And we are going to share the, the PowerPoint with everybody if we have your email address. So thank you very much for listening and staying with us for one hour, 30 minutes. We are going to continue this discussion same time, same time next week. Thank you very much. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.